Uh, hey, Robert. Hey, Rob. So, uh, so this week there was an interesting uh, business story that kind of, uh, I don't know, reminded me of the of 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 a long, long time ago, and that is the U.S. Steel, uh, the big steel manufacturer in the United States, and and really a, a, a kind of a, a U.S. name that's been around for I think 122 years. It was created by Carnegie. Uh, some of the first antitrust legislation was targeted at this evil monopoly that that uh, JP Morgan and Carnegie put together. Um, it was bought by, uh, of all places, you know, our, our sworn enemy and uh, uh, a Japanese steel company, uh, Nippon, Nippon Steel. Um, You're 80 years out of out of sync with that. Well, but you oh, that's, right. that's right. Uh, well, it's confusing because I read, I read these press releases from um, uh, J.D. Vance, the Republican, Man Manchin, who I guess is not a Republican and not a Democrat, not clear what he is, and he might be running as an independent for president, and uh, a bunch of Democrats all saying, this is horrible, this is terrible, this is this is a national security issue. I mean, we need to not just manufacture steel in the United States, which Nippon will continue to do, um, with the U.S. steel plants, but we also need to own it in the United States. And, you know, part of this is kind of a re regression from an era, which I think we've lived through the last few decades, of real connection when it comes to trade, information, uh, and, and uh, cooperation around production, even of things like uh, like like steel and it needs to it seems to be kind of a big step backwards uh with regard to to the benefits of connection I, it's it's frustrating and and it, it's really kind of shocking because you know japan is one of our closest allies it's a key player um for us in asia um japan and south korea are like are I don't want to say they're like states because they're not, or you could just as easily say the United States is like their big brother to yeah. little brother. Um, but they're partners. And to I, I totally get the idea that national security, you need to be able to make steel in the event of you know the US being isolated in some way, because that's the United States, you know, biggest, and then you know, I'd say China's biggest advantages that they in theory could be self-contained but that's that should be viewed as a worst case scenario yeah. where you know you you eliminated connection from the rest of the world we've all gotten enormously poor uh there's obviously some sort of conflict going on like that's a horrible outcome but if you want insurance to say yeah we need to have steel plants we need to have manufacturing so we can build what we need we need located in the united states I'm I'm sympathetic to that that discussion. I, I think it's focused. It's like AI focusing on you know what happens if it kills us all. Well, if you always focus on the negative, then you end up missing a lot of the positives. But I can only see that. But this is this is crazy. So if if a bunch of Japanese investors bought you know 100 shares of U.S. Steel and then eventually Japanese citizens owned all of U.S. Steel, would that be a disaster? Would that be a national security issue? I mean, we're we're supposedly talking about national security, and arguably we're talking about ownership, but what we're really talking about is control. And you know, yep. they're the people who the anti ingenuists many of whom reside in Washington D.C., are all about control, and control is the opposite of ingenuism. Ingenuism is giving people space to do amazing stuff. Uh, whereas control is, you know, if we don't have our fingers on all of the buttons, then something bad is going to happen. You know, in I can remember in the 80s, there was a movie, I can't remember the name of it, but Michael Keaton was in it. And it was about a Japanese auto company coming in and buying a U.S. auto company. Uh, and it was, of course, a disaster. The union was all against it. They had to cheat. And the end of the movie, the happy ending was, you know, they brought all these management techniques that were why Japanese car companies were doing so well and U.S. car companies were doing relatively poorly. 
they brought all of that in and turned around and suddenly the plant with the you know in America with American workers was productive and highly reliable cars and you know all the good things happened and everybody won which is exactly how it goes that's the whole point of ingenuism when you connect to in this case it was Japanese management techniques for auto manufacturing everybody wins yeah. uh, and I would love to see you know U.S. Steel is it has a an amazing founding story. Its origins are absolutely amazing, but it's been an Osaran in steel production for you know 50 years. And I would love to see someone come in and turn that around. And and there's no reason why that auto story can't happen here. I mean, Nippon is is the fourth largest steel manufacturer before this deal in the world. It's obviously been successful. Um it, U.S. Steel has not. Maybe they can bring some of the management, some of the technology. M maybe they can share some technological ideas across this larger company, and and actually and actually be a a, a massive success. Um, and you know, you and I are not experts on steel making. Uh, yeah. We kind of barely know the difference between blast furnace versus electric arc, and but it's clear that U.S. Steel. I mean, you don't have to be an expert to know that they have not been at the leading edge. They haven't been contributing to the betterment of humanity through producing steel. Now, Nucor ar arguably has been very much contributing to the betterment yep. of, of humanity. So they so have been U.S. companies that have been, but but U.S. Steel was not on that list. And even in the steel industry. And yep. you, know, you have the same thing, and you can see the same thing in the auto industry where you've got big entrenched players that are very successful because of protections that they've been granted uh, in the case of the auto industry on light trucks and SUVs and then steel, you know, it's very explicit. We're just going to tax the uh, import of steel 25%. And then you have other companies that are actually contributing the, the new cores, the Teslas that are, are changing the world uh, and to focus on trying to somehow keep in amber this fossilized corporation it's just it's very very frustrating and very counterproductive and like we talked about last week uh when you look at it you actually see it on both sides you see we aren't going to let you pair up with this mm -hmm. successful japanese company so we're going to hold you down and at the same time we're going to tax imports so we're going to hold you up and of course it breaks down because the, the whole point of buying U.S. steel is that it's incredibly profitable to be a U.S. steel maker right now because of the Trump tariffs. And so, so the Trump tariffs are one you, you get, you know, Nippon cannot sell steel into the United States. They suffer a 25 percent tax on that. And the second aspect of it, which is interesting, is there's a massive demand for steel domestically right now because of. Uh, you know, a, a whole slew of government programs to, you know, to build factories, to build chip uh, factories, to build uh, battery factories, to build other kind of stuff. Uh, whether it's infrastructure bill was based on U.S. sourced. Yeah, and everything requires. So you cannot build a windmill, right? I mean, the Biden administration is subsidizing windmills, uh, and but you cannot build a windmill. If it doesn't have 100 percent U.S. steel, and, get so, the and yeah, and so you're getting a subsidy to pay a, high, a higher price because of the tariffs for U.S. steel versus Japanese steel. I mean, of course, every steel company in the world would love to have a presence in the United States to be cashing in on the largesse of the U.S. government, and at the same time, distorting markets uh, 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 dramatically and and. You know, who knows where steel should be consumed, but we know that the primary consumption is going to be in the years to come, those areas that are being subsidized. Yeah. And if uh, you, we look at, you know, the way the market is responding, the natural reaction for people looking at this, okay, here are the rules. Okay, here's how we should play it. Let's bring in this people who know how to make steel and let's sell them the assets that are favorably located in this case in the u.s and we'll make more steel and we'll sell at this premium price everyone will make more money but no the the solution is now getting bad mouth to, to the problems that were created by the same people who are objecting to the solution and it's important to note that this is 
just a, a clear violation of the principles of ingenuism. Yep. If you abide by ingenuism, you would never do any of this. And that it is clearly value destroying in terms of progress, in terms of making steel available to whether it's for windmills or for, for something else. Uh, that and maybe competitor to Tesla, right? Maybe maybe there's a new innovator out there with a new electric car thing, and they but but steel is twenty five percent more expensive than it should be, or whatever more expensive. That's than it a should great be. example because Tesla's just you know recently started shipping and you know delivering the Cybertruck, which is made <laughs> with stainless steel and not aluminum, and yeah. you know, having a cheap, reliable, high quality source of steel that can innovate because it turns out it's really hard to make car bodies out of stainless steel. But that just because it's hard at the beginning, it, it's almost meaningless because as we've seen, it's hard to launch reusable rockets. But then if you do it for a while, uh, which are also made out of stainless steel, by the way, uh, if you do it for a while, you get better at it. And then suddenly it becomes relatively easy and you get huge cost savings. And you, know, you can imagine a world where all cars are made out of stainless steel, which has you know huge advantages over traditional steel in terms of longevity and rusting, and you know that that we could you could see that, but you never get there without taking that first step. And then of course you need the improvement cycle, and you know trying to improve with U.S. steel is probably a dead end. Yes, and uh, and you know and and we can extrapolate, I think, from this example to we talked about this last week as well. This whole cycle of subsidizing, regulating, uh, you know, and and it, it is unbelievably wasteful and destructive. And what we're really missing out are the missed opportunities of the kind of innovation that could be happening. Uh, the kind of if resources were allowed to flow to to where that, you know, to the best ideas, rather than the best ideas, we're getting the best ideas out of Washington, which traditionally has not been the best place for, uh, for for business ideas, for technology and innovation. Absolutely. I mean, it's counter ingenuism at its worst, where the decisions are being made in a top down fashion, and there's no room for new ideas and new innovations to emerge because you're set in this narrow box of rules. So instead of using ingenuity to actually make progress, you use ingenuity to game the rules. And that's that's one of the biggest I, costs of a central uh, control and command is that you know, as soon as the bureaucracy builds up, then everyone's spending their time figuring out how to navigate the bureaucracy. Yeah, and the other part of ingenuism, you know, exploration and 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 the, the ability to fail and and uh that whole mechanism usually gets broken as well, because once you're starting to subsidize a particular industry, the last thing you want is to see it fail. And uh, and and all of these things, uh, you know, feed off of each other and ultimately to slow, slow everything down um, in, in spite of some of the amazing efforts of uh, entrepreneurs and uh, innovators that are out there. And I think we should acknowledge that, you know, one of the, the guardrails on uh, what's happened out of Washington historically is that things have been allowed to fail. That yes, uh, there is a level, a point, whether it's a big bank or a big automaker, where it's not allowed to fail. But those aren't the most innovative anywhere. That what you need when where the learning is really happening is in I'll say startups, but they can be quite big. And you know we saw a bunch of industrial policy coming out of the financial crisis. You know, these crises are an opportunity to spend money if it's spent on pet projects. And, and if the, the central authorities, if the politicians making the decisions had control over how it goes, yeah, they're human. They would never let go. Yep. You know, just keep plugging more money in. That's uh, not, yeah. not how it is. I think that's how it is in, in some places. You know, certainly in South America, we see that. Um, and, and arguably, we see it in parts of Asia. Uh, and the one of the most important things is to not lose that source of discipline to you know have the Solaris actually go out of business when it turns out that that was money poorly wasted and that was money poorly spent. And while you know it was wasted, arguably, um, you know we do have to keep in mind that that trying things as long as you try small and let them fail, even at the government level. 
it can be very productive and, and be a big contribution. But in the U.S. Steel case, it's clearly not because we've seen this kind of policy. We've seen multiple saving, you know, need to save the U.S. traditional U.S. auto industry. Uh, at this point, we've learned our lesson. At least we should have learned our lesson. But clearly, from what's coming out of Washington, we haven't. No, and it seems that if you're looking for growth and you're looking for progress, the U.S. has a comparative advantage when it comes to knowledge industries and and uh, kind of what's considered tech, but really everything with regards to human knowledge, and that 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 is that feeds off of connection maybe more than any other industry, and it is it is where we have the comparative advantage and sucking resources away from that in order to prop up stuff that other people do much better uh, seems to be a, a massive waste. And it gets in the way of actually learning from the people who yep. do much better. Um, on the, I guess the plus side, U.S. Steel, despite its storied history is, and, and getting a huge premium to its former market value, uh, is still just a 17 billion, is that the number? Uh, it's, it's Something like that, it's, it's insignificant. Compared. Uh, it's yeah. smaller now in real terms, significantly smaller now in real terms than when it went public in 1902, three, four, something like that. So uh, uh, they have they have lost value over the last 80 years. So yes, at one point it was the largest company in the world, mm -hmm. which today would be you know comparable to you know let's just ignore the extraction industries and say Apple, you know, three trillion dollars versus 17 million. Now that's a that's a big gap. <laughs> big gap all right uh we are taping this just before christmas so merry christmas robert merry christmas here on see you in uh, 2024 yes look forward to it